depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how untraceable are his ways. The portion of God's knowledge that forms the basis of our meditation today comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Here ends our text. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed, in life, we like to take little surveys and inventories to communicate information. One of the most popular ways of doing this is by using a scale from 1 to 10. For example, if you go into the doctor's office, you might be asked, how would you rate the pain on a scale from 1 to 10? 1 being no pain and 10 being extreme pain. Or perhaps when lunchtime rolls around and you're out with friends, you might ask, how hungry are you on a scale from 1 to 10? Using a scale like that helps us take an inventory of information and helps us communicate that information to other people so that they know what we're thinking. And it can be used for just about anything in life. In our text for today, Jesus takes an inventory of his disciples' faith, in particular, Peter's faith. The main intent of the account is easy for us to determine. The disciples' faith was very weak, and Jesus used this storm on the Sea of Galilee as an example that they needed to trust in Him and not themselves. In many ways, we can say the same about our lives, but there's an even more important lesson for us to learn from these words today, and a lesson that talks about how we strengthen our faith, how we build and sustain upon the faith in our Savior that we have. And what we see in our text and in God's Word is that God often uses things that seem plain and ordinary to us. So often we like to tell ourselves, we like to convince ourselves that if we were in the shoes of the disciples or in the shoes of other biblical characters, we would have a much greater and a much stronger faith. If we could only witness a few or maybe even one of the extraordinary signs in the Bible, one of the extraordinary miracles of our Savior, well then certainly we would never doubt again. Certainly we would never question our Savior. We would have a rock-solid faith. Certainly this type of thinking seems logical to our minds. Oftentimes I myself have felt the same way, that if the Lord would just give me a sign, I would trust in Him so much more than I do now. Well, God, what God's Word tells us about faith, how faith is created, how it is strengthened, how it operates, increasingly shows us that it does not rest on what we experience or what we can see or witness with our eyes, but what God gives us as assurance in His Word. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith is created by listening to the Word of God. No additional sign, no additional miracle is needed. Jesus taught that faith is small as a mustard seed, something that was barely noticeable to human eyes, was strong enough that it could displace mountains. How could that be if faith needs to be so big or needs to see so many miracles or signs in order to be effective? 
at the end of Mark's Gospel account, we're left with a scene that depicts the foundation of the early church. The very last verse of Mark's Gospel says, The disciples went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Again, the miracles that were performed were not there to be the basis of the faith. That was the preaching. The, the word of God was the basis of Christian faith. The signs were simply the accompaniment. Finally, perhaps the simplest statement on faith best describes why it is not dependent on miracles and signs. From 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. The very essence of faith, the very definition here given, shows that it is based on what is unknown to our physical senses, particularly what we see with our eyes. Perhaps God has chosen to, by and large, end the age of physical materials, or physical miracles, because He does not want people to rest on those miracles for the foundation of their faith. He wants their faith to rest in the works of their Savior, written and recorded for us in the Word of God. Even when you look at Jesus in his ministry, he was somewhat hesitant at times to perform miracles because he knew that it would point people to the miracles and point them away from the preaching. As mindless sheep that we are, we have a tendency to ooh and ah at what we see with our eyes, but not so much with what we believe in our hearts. Jesus even commanded people at times not to repeat or not to tell others about a certain miracle that he did because he knew it would create quite a stir. He knew the commotion that it would create and it would have a detraction from the preached word. So if God is so clear in his word that faith rests on his word, then why don't more people trust in that word? Why do so many people, including ourselves, often beg God for a physical sign to see with our eyes? Why would we do that if we have the most powerful thing right before us? Well, the answer is that for many people, including ourselves, God's Word, God's written Word, seems like such an ordinary thing. When what we want is something extraordinary. Doesn't it make sense when you think about it, though, that people looking for a relationship with God by faith would look for something extraordinary? When you look at what faith does for us, how faith creates a relationship with us, with the living and eternal God who made heaven and earth, faith sustains us by offering us the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life through the name of our Savior Jesus. Those are extraordinary things. Should we look for that by extraordinary means? But God's Word, God's written book, seems just so ordinary to us, doesn't it? seems like there's really nothing special or extraordinary about it. This is one of the pitfalls that we must avoid because we have free and unlimited access to that written word. The temptation for us is to take it for granted and to be always on the lookout for something better, something more exciting, something more extraordinary because we've been brought up with this word our entire lives. This is why we as 21st century Christians hear so much about salvation experiences or being able to recognize the very moment that I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior or people telling us that we need to be able to show and prove how much faith we really have before we can really trust that faith. All of these are examples of gimmicks that are used to detract from the power of God's Word. Gimmicks that make us focus more on what we do, what we observe, what we see, rather than what God tells us in His Word. The fact is that God's Word, even God's written Word in the Bible, is the most extraordinary thing in our lives. If you want an example of this, just ask our brothers and sisters overseas who have grown up for most of their lives without God's Word. What a precious and extraordinary gift that that word is to them now. That word has unlocked to them the message that they don't need to follow a false god. They don't need to compete on their own to win salvation. They don't need to prove it and show how many good works before God that they can accomplish. That word has unlocked to them the greatest gift that we could ever have in our lives. The gift that our sins have been forgiven and that God has saved us. No miracle, no outward sign 
needed to give them this information. They don't rely on what they can see with their eyes, what they can observe with their hands. They rely on the Word of God. It is a precious and extraordinary gift to them. But what's the difference between our brothers and sisters overseas and us? The difference is God's Word is fresh and new for them, and we're used to God's Word. God's Word seems normal and ordinary and plain. As we look at our text, we see a valuable lesson that we can learn about faith. Interestingly, this account from the Sea of Galilee, as Matthew puts it, came immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. Now certainly, if there was a sign or a miracle that Jesus did which could build my faith and be the foundation of my faith, certainly the feeding of the 5,000 would have to be at the top of that list. When you look at all the miracles of the Bible, there are fewer uh, miracles that are greater or more extraordinary than that one. And yet, after this miraculous event, Jesus takes a moment, Jesus takes the time to take an inventory of the disciples' faith, to rate it on a scale from 1 to 10, if you will. Now, anyone who's been on a boat before knows how quickly the winds and the waves can increase. This was especially a common occurrence on the Sea of Galilee. It was especially well known for quick storms that would strike at any minute. On top of this, we can see very clearly that the storm must have been a big one because the disciples themselves couldn't fight through it. They were well-experienced fishermen for the most part. They were used to being on the boat, but even they couldn't conquer it. This is no doubt a strong test from the Lord and ultimately a powerful reminder for the disciples and for us to trust in Him alone. When Jesus approached the disciples during the fourth watch, it was about 3 to 6 a.m. in that time frame. At this point, the disciples obviously had been struggling for several hours against the storm. Their situation probably seemed helpless. I'm sure they wondered if they'd make it through the night or even if they'd make it out alive. But at this lowest point of desperation, Jesus comes to them. Very often our lives echo the very same thing, don't they? It's often at the times when we're most desperate, that we're most down in the dumps, that Jesus will come to us again. Desperation in life can take any number of examples or forms. Perhaps it could be financial struggles and uh, contemplating how we can make ends meet month by month by month, just living month by month, paycheck by paycheck. Perhaps it could be something worse or more serious like a mental or physical problem with our bodies where our minds and our bodies don't operate the way they should and we tend to convince ourselves of things that aren't true or aren't real. Even rifts in relationships with our closest friends and loved ones can create times of desperation and hardship. But Jesus comes to us at these moments and reminds us what he gives us to strengthen our faith. To strengthen our faith that not only will restore our relationship with Jesus, but will help us with the troubles that we face in this life. In fact, the real hope that we have as Christians does not really begin until we take a step back and stop trying so hard ourselves. Just like you look at the example of the disciples, their hope really didn't come until Jesus approached them until they stopped struggling and fighting against the storm and let their Savior's power shine forth. We may try on our own in life to solve all of our problems on our own. We may be the first option that we go to when we have a trouble or a trial, and it may seem like it may work sometimes, but there's always going to come something in life. There's always going to be a wind or a wave here or there that's going to set us off course. It's going to be stronger than we can handle on our own. Jesus implores us to look to Him immediately. Don't look at Him as a last second option. Don't go to Him after you've tried everything yourself and you can't do it alone. Go to Him first every day. Make Him the main priority in your life. When you look at the way that Jesus spoke to the disciples and especially to Peter, it's almost as if he's talking directly to you and me. When you isolate each of the statements in this section, they're the same simple message that he brings to us when we're tested. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Come. 
And oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In every moment that your faith is tested, Jesus brings you these very same thoughts. He first reminds you that He is in control. Do not be afraid. Take heart. He is here with you. Not only is every fear, doubt, discouragement, desperation taken away by Jesus, but He also supplies everything that is good, everything that is needed. He's readily and willing to give them to you. Once His life-giving power is in view, Jesus then invites you through His Word. He tells you to come. Come to Him and receive relief and help that your faith will be strengthened, not destroyed. And finally, Jesus leaves you with a simple reminder moving forward. Don't doubt. Trust in Him by faith. Oh, you of little faith, do not doubt, but look to Him with all your problems. So often we can look past after a problem with 20-20 vision and see God's handiwork in action, see God's plan and say, wow, how foolish we really were that we didn't trust God more. Jesus gives you an opportunity to not just look back and trust, but to trust in Him in the present, to look to Him when you have problems, when these things are going on, when you're confronted with sin, and see His help and His care. Jesus calls for you to listen the very same way that he called to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee that day. He wants to calm the storm of sin in your heart. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to conquer those problems as he conquered the wind and the waves that day on Galilee. The danger that you as a modern day Christian has is that you will miss out on this call because you're looking for something better because you're looking for something more, because you're looking for something that seems more extraordinary. Peter was looking for that same something when he was walking on the water. Peter was looking for something extraordinary when he glanced at the wind and the waves and he became afraid. Peter got caught up in the details and all the distractions of the world around him instead of focusing on Jesus. So often we have made that same mistake in our spiritual lives. We get caught up in what seems new and exciting, what seems different and extraordinary, instead of focusing on our Savior's eyes. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus by hearing His message in His Word. Looking intently into that Word is the same as looking into the very eyes of your Savior. And that gaze reveals the truly extraordinary ways that God strengthens your faith. The wonder of baptism, how God takes ordinary, plain water mixed with His gospel of salvation and washes sin out of your hearts and lays the foundation of His kingdom in its place. The splendor and majesty of the Lord's Supper, how the Lord takes common elements like wine and bread and He offers you His very body through them, His very blood through them, given and shed for your forgiveness of sins on your behalf. And finally, through that plain and ordinary written word that you hear spoken to you every week, every day, that's the same as hearing your very Savior speaking to you. What extraordinary means God really does use to bring us to faith, to, to strengthen and sustain that faith and improve upon that faith. Don't allow the passage of time or the mere repetition of these things to detract from the all-important message that they are. Don't allow Satan, your flesh, or the world to tempt you into thinking that they're just powerless rituals, that there's really nothing behind God's Word, that there's always something better on the other side. The truth is that the gifts that God gives you are the most powerful you can ever know in your life. The gifts of baptism, the Lord's Supper, and His spoken and written word. They're greater, in fact, than the most powerful things of this world. They're greater and more powerful than sin, death, and Satan. Things that we have no control over on our own. God's gifts may seem and feel ordinary because we're used to them. Because we've been brought up in them. Because we hear them time and time again but that doesn't change the power that they have. So how would you rate your faith on a scale from 1 to 10? Well, if you're honest, it's 
probably not very good. So what do you do? Try a little harder? Work a little more? Pray a little more? Look with greater intent and try to find a sign from God? How about you take a step back and listen to your Savior speak? Here He is in His Word telling you, do not be afraid. He beckons you to come to Him by water and the Word, by bread and wine, by His body and blood, by His written Word. Focus on those gifts and use them. Don't let the extraordinary winds and waves of this world detract you from the extraordinary gifts that God's given you. We close with a message of advice from King Solomon in the book of Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be health to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Amen.